you're not as fat as the internet says. And I was like, huh? Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, there's a Reddit thread about like an over under on when you die. And mm-hmm. and by the way, <laughs> that death thing is very real. I get emotional. <laughs> You remember when I said on stream? Do you remember when I said on stream I find it really odd that there are people out there that are waiting for Tom for Bert to die to like kind of justify their concern or you know to 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 almost kind of you know prove that you know drinking is bad for you or something. Remember when I said that? I guess he's seen it too. I guess he's seen these threads because I I don't I didn't I didn't think he actually saw all that stuff around him. But I think in the last few years it's got. But you know what's funny about all that stuff? To take it back. I'm already stopping at 12 seconds. You know what's really funny? He's partly to blame. I think he kind of carries himself in a way where he's like, look what I can get away with. You know? I think he kind of, he kind of is the one that makes people want, like he carries himself in a way of like, look what I can get away with being a grown up. So naturally people who live a regular life and work a nine to five and are adults and say, but they're like, how the fuck is he still alive? And that's what stirs up the whole kind of conversation around him dying. I think he's actually, he kind of, he's weirdly the cause of it. I'm not going to lie. Because he kind of, you know, the Mickey Mantle gene thing, he kind of has a lot of pride in the fact that he hasn't died yet. Oh my God, I got my blood work done. The doctor says I'm super healthy. Like all this sort of shit. He kind of leans into it. So complaining that people are speculating about when you're going to die because you're a functioning alcoholic, but then also bragging about it as a way to like show how special you are because you're an alcoholic that's able to succeed and be a millionaire and do all these amazing things. You know, it's typical, typical victim complex for some comedians, isn't it? Always fucking the victim, always the hero of their story. You have to choose one. Think about this. Maybe just a couple times if people, when I'm gone. <laughs> you know what he's crying about? He's not crying about the thought of him losing, you know, missing his family or whatever. He's actually crying about not being amazing anymore and people not being able to see his content and shit. That's what he's actually crying about. Like, I can't believe I'm going to die one mo- at one time and people are not going to see my Instagram stories. They're not going to see my marketing clips. That's what he's actually crying about. Not his family, not missing seeing his kids grow up or maybe having grand or, you know, raising his grandkids. No, he's thinking about all the content we're going to miss. <laughs> When he's gone. <laughs> People just go like, it would be so much cooler if Burb was here. Yeah, Austin Casey. Who the F is Ed Milet and why is burnt on his podcast? Good good question. Who is Ed Milet? Let me, let me Google that. Who is Ed Milet? Big up Austin Casey. Who the fuck is Ed Milet? Who the fuck is that? Yeah, Ed Milet is an accomplished entrepreneur with a sincere desire. What kind of blurb is that? with a sincere desire to help others by sharing what he has learned as a businessman, husband, and philanthropist. Basically, he's a grifter. He kind of looks like Rob Cardone, right? Yeah, I I sense grifting. I sense MMLs. I sense motivational speaker. I sense realize your power. What do you think it... What do you what do you think it is about these people in Hollywood? Like, can somebody someone explain to me how do these guys seem to be able to infiltrate podcasts, especially comedians? Like, how, what do you think it is about these people that people can't seem to like see past? Because they're so they're so transparent. Like, why do you think people seem to like not be able to to sniff out bullshit artists like this? Like, you know, look at look at these pictures. The Rolls Royce in front of the private jet. It's like, come on, bro. Come on. Come on. The celebrity friends. Look, look who's look, look who's hanging out. Look at that. Come on. Anthony Robbins. Like, come on. It's so bizarre. Like. Anyway. Wait, we got saying here? There's a whole thread on the Ed on the Discord. Oh, really? Shit. Okay, cool. PDP podcast is triple lower case. They've just replaced inf- inf- Okay, yeah, that's a good point. They just replaced infomercials. Very good point there, Adriana. <laughs> the worst fattest flexor. 
lows. Like, you, wouldn't it be great if Bert was here and he just walked in with a bottle of champagne and and a crazy story or like I just like <laughs> that ego is fucking crazy. <laughs> wouldn't it be better if Bert was here? <laughs> Some people are like, oh, I wish Nelson Mandela was still around, right? I wish Muhammad Ali, you know, didn't have to suffer the way he did, you know, during the latter stages of his life, right? And he could really kind of, you know, get his flowers and whatever, maybe. All these fucking good stuff. I wish you could maybe go back in time and maybe, you know, kill baby Hitler. Whatever all these things are. Nah, people, what they really wish, Bert was here to have shots. <laughs> This guy's fucking insane, bro. Just when we thought we were out, he pulled us back in. Bert's appearance on Ed Milet's podcast this week was truly extraordinary. <sighs> there really never has been another comedian as delusional as Bert and the people he surrounds himself with. And if you think I'm hyping this up, just take a look at this. Difficult. Love doing stuff I don't like to do. I think that would surprise people about you because you ha you are like a disciplined guy. You do have these routines that you do. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> can you say you're disciplined when you're overweight? Is that possible? Or is that completely eradicated? Like, can you say you're disciplined when you're overweight? If you're above your recommended BMI, can you actually say you're disciplined? Like, can you use that as a as a way to describe yourself? It's like saying you're rich when you got no money, isn't it? Like, can you say that? Or oh, I'm a homeowner, but you rent. It's like, but you can't say you're a homeowner if you don't actually own a home. How can you say you're disciplined when your body is one of the best examples or best representation of your discipline and you're not able to kind of keep that in some level of control or under some level of control? How is that possible? Oh, you know what's funny? When you search for this Ed Milet guy on, on YouTube, on Google, sorry, another person that gets recommended to him is the other king of grifters, Tom Bailu. These people who kind of make a career out of speaking to other people who are successful and making a name off the back of that, I find them to be some of the worst grifters ever. Like, I'm just going to build my success on talking to people who've actually achieved some level of success. And then I'm going to give courses and do motivational seminars about what I've learned about talking to people who are successful. It's like, huh? Shouldn't they be on stage? Shouldn't you get the people that you speak to and that you motivate? Shouldn't they be on stage, actually? Because, you know, they're the ones who are actually successful, not you. I find that grift to be one of the worst grifts in the world. You are kind of into personal development and self-help, yet there's the machine side of you. Yeah. That everybody sees, like, this dude's out of control. This dude's a big drinker, big partier, a lot of dabbles in everything. And so this is why you're so fascinating to me, because you're you're this... Big up, Ricky. Bert did nothing wrong. He did everything, everything right. Exactly. Big up, Ricky. Picture. Exactly. Basically. That's the thing, in it? You know what? That's the through line between low cows and some of these fucking podcast comedians. They're very similar in that, right? I did nothing wrong. I did everything correct. I'm amazing. I'm also the biggest victim. Look at how amazing my life is. Oh my God, everybody's bullying me. Hmm. And, and when people watch you, no, I'm being serious. I think when people watch you, it's it can seem... On the surface, the shirt's off, hilarious as hell, filling up arenas all over the place now. There's a one-dimensional dude, I got it, there's a shtick yeah. there. Then you listen to your comedy, it's not shtick. You listen to your routine and your life and how you actually got here, and there's a depth and dimension to you that I think would surprise most people, including the fact that you're really a routine dude. You swim almost every single morning, right? Yeah, I work out every morning. I have a trainer who comes to my house. <laughs> I, I watch what I eat. I'm pretty strict on my diet. <laughs> Come on, Bert, man. Stop the cap. Stop the cap. You look great, by the way. Oh, right thank now. you very much. I'm down 40 pounds. Stop the um, cap. Okay, whoa. Hang on a second. Let's Stop back up cap. that truck. Did it just lay out how multi dimensional Bert Kreischer is? Bert's about as multi dimensional as Tom Segura's side chick, Lauren Compton. <laughs> but that was only the start of it. See, this is the problem. Ed thought he was hyping up Bert, warming up his audience for this once-in-a-generation talent, and he completely forgot that Bert inevitably turns every discussion he's involved in into a therapy session. And it didn't take long for him to show his emotions and start crying. It wasn't his love for family or his friends that triggered him. Oh no, we're talking about Bert here. It was his love for himself that got him in the end. 
Do you know what a blessing it is that you have what you have? I kind of do. That sounds really crazy, but I yeah. kind of... That's the one thing that you see again with Low House. Like, that's the thing that's been fascinating me about um, watching Low House because I always assumed when you, were, when you were a narcissist that you almost... Scammer alert. The SEC has charged Impact Theory, a.k.a. Tom Billu, with conducting an unregistered offering of crypto asset securities, the agency said. You see, look who is, again, I'm not somebody that does the whole association thing too much, but I'm sorry. If you're in the company of the Tom Bellew guys and he's getting accused of fucking cryptocurrency fraud, like in case you suggested there, but yet somehow this guy's got a show on Sirius. You see what I mean about the podcasting, content, radio thing? As much as I, just full of scammers. But I also think the industry kind of empowered them to be scammers because they just gave, it's just, everyone's been overpaid, really. That's where the bubble burst. Not because the shows are shit, but mostly because they just ran out of money, <laughs> basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, hey, what do I know? What do I Anyway, what I was saying before, big up um, Austin Casey, I appreciate it, brother. What I was saying before, I find it really interesting how these narcissists nowadays on con in content creation world these comedy podcasters they're narcissistic and they're very self-absorbed they have very you know delusional opinions about themselves but i always thought it was interesting because i couldn't understand in my head why they would because of what they look like does that make any sense like wings and boogie and dsp you know are probably you know three of the ugliest people that you've ever seen walk the face of this earth two of them are over 400 pounds but the way they speak about themselves with such confidence you'd think they were fucking brad pitt or something it's so odd same goes with for bert like what have you actually achieved in your life like actually you're a mediocre stand-up comedian you got into podcasting early that's why you're basically done well in that regard you're friends with joe rogan but then the way he talks about himself the way he kind of walks the way he carries himself you'd think he was fucking i don't know you think he fucking created Netflix or something? It's like, huh? If I have in the moment on stage thought, this is really cool. Uh, you get to take people out of their memory, out of their out of their thoughts for a second, and you get to get them to be present and laugh. And if and I, I've said this before, if, if I can leave anything, I would my my legacy. I would love for it. Uh, I'll get emotional. Mm. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I get emotional thinking about this. Maybe just a couple times if people, when I'm gone. <laughs> the ego. I'm so amazing. Like, I'm so amazing. And it'd be so much cooler if Bert was here. <laughs> like, God, we'd have so much fun. Like, you, wouldn't it be great if Bert was here and he just walked in with a bottle of champagne and, <laughs> and a crazy story or like, I just it's like. Fucking insane. Oh my God, Bert, you're just fucking nuts. I mean, I don't need to cure anything but like oh really you don't you don't need to cure anything you don't need to actually cure a fucking disease <laughs> and save millions of people's lives all you need to do is drink all you need to do is buy people shots that's what you need to do to actually give something back to humanity is all you need to do is to be a party guy is to be an adult frat boy a 50 plus year old guy stuck in his fucking college era that's what you need that's what that's what leaving a lasting legacy is not curing terminal illnesses and shit. No, 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 no. Let's just be the guy that buys people Jaeger bombs. <laughs> just for people to go like, God, man, I wish he was here. That was that would be so fun. Mm. Like just, and I don't need it to be the world. Just like, yeah. like a solid hundred people <laughs> to just be like, man, can you imagine if Bert was here? Mm. Like that, that energy. I think it's what it, it that energy is what defines me. It's what I've always wanted and searched for as a kid. Is is I I wanted I, <laughs> I wanted people to like miss me, and like I noticed Jesus that like Christ, the ego, bro. at a certain the point, ego. like if I left the room, no one cared, and if I wasn't there, no one was like, "Where's Bert?" I feel like I'm I feel like I'm just building to hopefully get it to the place where people go like god man you're like yeah i wouldn't it be cool if bert was here i, I know my daughters will say that but uh, 
I know my daughters will miss that I'm not there as opposed to I'm going to miss not being able to see them grow old and start families and shit. What? The fucking fuck, bro. But in some parts, in some ways, sorry, it's, it's almost better that he's like this and he says this because it is quite congruent to how he actually acts. He is very self-absorbed. He is very self-centered. He is very jealous. So it's um, um, selfish. So it's actually quite nice that he says these type of things because it matches his personality and how he acts. It is all about him. It is a Burt show at all times. So his, his view on things, his perspective is very much me, 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 me. Pick up a picture. Wings Boogie and DSB had highlights in their careers too. Once they got out of the spotlight, the curtains lifted and the real show started like Bert. 100%, 100%, Ricky Pitcher, 100%, 100%. But that's the thing. There's so much of a shit show now that it kind of, it kind of take, it kind of makes you forget about the highlights. That's a problem. They turn into such shit shows, you forget all the highlights. And all you remember is the bad shit. That's the issue. And they can't seem to see that sort of thing. Oh. That's it. It's just like on a Sunday morning when, when yeah. someone opens a bottle of champagne and mm -hmm. goes like... Mm. Who's, who's drinking champagne on a Sunday morning? <laughs> what? Is that... Anyway. I would have brought a joint. <laughs> 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 Bro, you've said three or four things today like in the history of the show or like my favorite things ever said. Oh, and the reason there's a bunch Jesus Christ, bro. This is how they make it, innit? They suck up to really rich people and successful people. No, that doesn't make any sense though, because I'm thinking to it, like, I still can't work it out. Why do people who've actually achieved something in their lives seem to always be next to people like this? Like, how do they seem to attract them? Because a fa if a fan try to suck up to Bert the way this guy's sucking up to him, he'd kind of look down on him. Like a lot of these comedians don't actually like their fan bases. I think a lot of them kind of despise their fans a little bit. There's a little bit of like, I don't know. I think I feel like a lot of them kind of secretly feel like Tom, but they would never say it. They kind of do despise their fan base. So on one sense, if you stop Tom or Bert at an airport and try to suck them off the way he did, they'd kind of look, they'd kind of shoo you away. But then for some reason, when these grifters get in front of them, it becomes way more, they take, I don't know, they seem to be like duped by it more. And I can't seem to work out why. A bunch of people crying with you. The one, they want that too. And some people are sitting there going, I wonder if anybody would miss me. Okay, who's seriously crying with Bert? Like, apart from crying with laughter. But we've heard this before from him, right? He thinks about whether people will miss him, and honestly, I just cannot relate to that. I stopped and thought about it for a while, you know, trying to put myself in his shoes, and even just as a grown man myself, the problem is I really just don't care if people miss me or not when I die. Maybe if he said I get emotional thinking about all my family and friends when I pass away, hoping they'll be okay and that I did everything I could to be a good father, husband, and friend... But he's more worried about people missing him on a Sunday morning when they pop open champagne. Who drinks champagne on a Sunday morning? Now, exactly. look, we all know Bert's had... That's the thing, though. I don't think I've ever thought about that. Like, will people miss me? Like, again, maybe more so about what you will miss. I said, oh, man, I won't get a chance to fulfill my potential. I won't get a chance to live all these, you know, have all these experiences, go to these different places start a whatever start a family but again they're all kind of weirdly things that don't really it's not really about you too much but I, I, I don't but the ego's not that big to be like i wonder if people will miss me <laughs> like like you're picturing you know thousands of people crying about you passing away <laughs> you're kind of trying to you're trying to you're hoping they they make a big fuss about your funeral it's like a, you know what I mean? You have like people like hire millions of horses and, you know, a fucking hundred 
you know, car long motorcade or something. It's like had issues with drinking and for my regulars, we've been keeping track of his weight loss transformation. Those few months last year where he stopped drinking, started exercising and improved his diet, not to mention openly doing TRT. But anyway, up until now, I've heard him talk about how the catalyst for those changes were his daughters and his sister. But he opened up a little bit more in this interview about some of the other people who influenced his decision to get healthy. So take a look at this extended clip and I'll pick it up straight after. By the way, did you guys know that Bert had a stalker? If I asked you this question, because I think a lot of people hear feedback as criticism. So when even Ooh, buddies, that's a powerful statement, yeah, do because you, how do yeah. you hear it? When you hear that from people, you've got this number, you got a movie that killed it. You got your, your, this dude fills up anywhere he wants right now and he can do it multiple days Bert does you're making a ton of money podcaster crushing you know your your life is really really good right now there's probably a party that's like hey if this is you know do you know who you're dealing with here like I'm pretty functional so do you hear <laughs> feedback even from dudes who love you as criticism because most people that's how they hear it yeah yeah and what mm -hmm. stinks is that when I was at my my lowest and my lowest was these past probably seven months Starting in January, I did a European tour, then I did an arena tour in the States, and then I promoted the special. I then went to an Australian tour uh, in arenas, and then I did uh, another arena tour, promoted my movie. I did my fully loaded tour, which was six weeks, I think, this year. Lo God love this humble brag, isn't it? This is probably the lowest I've ever been. Look at all the money I made. Made money here, made money there, made more money here, made more money there. <laughs> so relatable i love this relatability so so relatable here then did the cruise and built the cruise was right before that but i was at my lowest and, and everyone <laughs> noticed and i will say that i <laughs> i was at my lowest surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people and they all noticed me they all noticed my emotions they all noticed how sad i was and they all wanted to make me happy got email yo big up uche in the chat wagwan but so self obsessed he'd stalk himself about it <laughs> exactly Bert would have one of those um you know how brendan's wife has got that 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 account which which i don't think is run by her i actually think she does have a fan that will do that but not all like an agency but you know, you know brendan's wife's got that account that's like um joanna fan or something and it just reposts her Instagram stories and says, oh my God, my idol, my this, whatever. So it wouldn't be surprising if Bert had one of those, but he set it up himself, but he forgot, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Bert, made a, Bert made his own fan account, but he forgot he made it himself. <laughs> and he's getting freaked out because all the stuff on there is really like personal and it's only stuff that he would know. <laughs> Mails from, I got texts from, from everyone one of them was tom's agent i just apologized to him the other night he texted me i'm worried about you whatever this and that and i was like whatever ran into him at dinner in new york with tom and i said to him hey man you're not my boy you're not my wife go f yourself if you if you want to be in my life sit down and have a drink with me but i don't even want to hear a word out of your mouth you don't spend time with me you don't know what my life's like i don't want to hear a word i said that steve Byrne. I said, you know what you know why he said that because that's how they really feel. I told you, what Tom Segura said was quite deplorable and obviously very rude and obviously, you know, not the greatest thing you want to hear. But that honestly wasn't that surprised because I've always felt like they've all felt like this. You kind of get the feeling there's a little bit of contempt buried deep underneath a lot of these comedians. Especially, and I found it especially weird because most of them, most of them, most of them have come from some level of privilege where they've been able, they've been afforded a life where they can take chances to pursue their dreams and shit. So you'd think they'd be a little bit more appreciative of that um, because the regular guy who may be trying to pursue comedy probably can't, maybe has to quit to get a real job to support their family. You'd think they'd be a little bit more understanding of it. But if anything, there's something oddly weird where they kind of have contempt on their fan base. So I always thought that Tom ran about the pause was more a reflection of how all of these guys feel as opposed to just Tom becoming an egomaniac and shit. I think they all feel like that. And this is a good example because look what he said to his people that are in the same industry as him. They're probably, you know, whatever. And he said what he said. So clearly the guy's a little bit Delulu. I said that to Tom. I said that to Joe. I said that to, I said that to 
everybody. Mm. Because at the time, what I was like, it, it when someone's concerned about you, it, you don't hear it that way. You don't hear. Mm -hmm. Basically, he's saying, let me crash out how I want to crash out. Basically, doing the same. He's doing the academics defense. Let me simp if I want to simp. Let me crash out if I want to crash out, which, I, which I'm actually encouraged. I think I said it in the stream before. This whole people trying to be concerned for his drinking and helping thing. Big up, sorry to tell. People like him suffer because they gain a level of success and still don't feel complete because he knows he's not loved, he's tolerated. A story to tell. Perfect, 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 perfect. But I think, you know what, to add to that also, I think another part of it is, I think a lot of it maybe comes down to probably undeserved as well. You kind of know a lot of your fame and maybe your wealth and stuff is a little bit disproportionate to your level of talent. I think most people have, there are some people that exist that just are completely delusional and literally think that they're worth what they're getting paid. But I think a lot of them kind of know, you know, I think a lot of them know. So I think that's what eats away at them, which is odd because I feel like you have to come to terms with that. I feel there's a lot of people out there that maybe get paid, you know, disproportionate as a, based on their talent. It just is what it is. You have to make the peace with it. But I feel like they have never really made peace of it because I think deep down they all know we grifters, you know, we chances, you know, like they all know they kind of chance the system and, you know, maybe that's what's eating away at them in the, in the big same, in the big sense of the word. The one person who I feel like doesn't feel that way is Brendan, oddly enough. The person with the least amount of talent is probably like someone like Brendan, I feel like has no understanding of that. He definitely feels like, no, I'm Dave Chappelle. I'm Louis C.K. Like, he doesn't. <laughs> He's special in that regard. Brendan's special. He definitely thinks, like, you know, I'm the guy. You you hear them saying, I'm better than you in some way. Or, or mm -hmm. I, I got my shit together. You need to get your shit together. I don't know what you hear, but I did not hear it well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it wasn't until I realized, oh, they're just, oh, it was my daughters who said they were worried about me. Mm -hmm. My daughters, when they went on tour with us, were fully loaded. We we had it was extremely stressful. You kind of, I don't understand why people like want pats. Like I don't, this isn't admirable. You're in your fifties, brother, and you have to have what all your closest friends that pull you to one side, plus your family, for you to finally get your life together. You're in your fifties. This is embarrassing, really. I don't see how this is like a, oh, yeah, they finally got through to me. Like, maybe, I can't say that. <laughs> I had a, uh, a stalker trying to kill me. It was like really bad. Serious? Yeah, it was really bad. And, 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 all, and, and by the way, I got, all this is just, it's bubbling over. It really is. And stalker trying to kill me. AKA somebody sent me a mean DM. Stalker trying to kill me. If that did happen, he'd be talking about it on the podcast ad nauseum. You know how he loves to fucking, you know, retell a story and add bits to it. This is probably some person DM'd him something mean or something. A stalker trying to kill me. Shut up. And and uh and my both my daughters at the end of Fully Loaded. Now uh, granted, Fully Loaded is with the 32 best comics in the world. Every week it's the new 10 comics. It's my best friends, my, the funniest people in the world. And we're cracking beers at, the, at, at this at breakfast. We're eating mushrooms. We're drinking at the show. We get on a tour bus. We party at night. It, it's f***ing fun as f***ing mm -hmm. I'm 270. <laughs> LOL, Silux. LOL. Discussed um, need to start getting into charity work and giving back to some people. <laughs> Big up, sorry to tell. Appreciate you. Bingo, he would rather look like a good comedian than actually put in the work to actually become one. That eventually catches up with you. Hey, hey, look at that. Look at my, I've got the best stream chat in the world. A story to tell and Silux basically saying the same thing. <laughs> More concerned with looking like a success than actually being a decent person. And then wondering why they don't feel complete. Then wondering why they don't feel accomplished, like because everything revolves around you. It's probably again, I'm no psychologist, I'm I'm not smart in that regard, but there probably is something 
very fun there's probably something very fundamental there's probably something integral to the human existence where you do need to think a little bit about other people in some parts of your life that's what, that's probably why people get pets and shit if you're not going to have kids you need to have something else that you care about more than yourself no i think there's something about the human condition where we kind of need that if you don't have that that's when you become a bit of a psycho that's when it gets a little bit crazy but I think we all need to have something we care about more than ourselves, whether it's charity work, whether it's fucking pets, whether it's children, whether it's a partner, whether it's somebody you adopt, whether it's a cause that you fight for, like, you know, whatever. You need something. But when you're purely driven by your own self-interest and it's always all about you, it's the you show, it's no, it's no surprise you end up like Bert. Even more so when you haven't had any real life, like you haven't really lived a real life. Like, you know, you've been afforded a life where you can like, because I always, I always feel like if that was me and I, and I was brought up the way that these guys were brought up, it would be a way to like try interesting things and become like a better person because you get the chance to kind of travel the world, meet different people or whatever it may be. And kind of, it gave me an appreciation of how I've grown up because you see how other people have grown up, whatever it may be. But for these guys, it seems to like, I don't know, it has the opposite effect. Really, really does have the opposite effect. Come on, play. You can't play. But I'm not 300 pounds. So like, and I'm benching 225 10 times. I'm strong as I feel good. I don't feel like shit. I feel like shit probably if we're going to be very honest. And my daughters both said like like at the gorge I killed like four beers at the end of the show last show. I killed four beers and one of them was an IPA. Mm -hmm. And I snapped. I was like, "Who the f gave me an IPA like to uh -huh. kill?" It was my daughter Georgia. <laughs> oh god. She goes, "Sorry, I don't drink. I don't know what a Bud Light looks like." Bless her heart. Yeah. And then and uh, don't you find that interesting? I knew that happened. I knew that happened. But the king of fucking, the king of um, indulgence, an actual raging alcoholic, has somehow given birth to two young girls, I think they're teenagers, who now don't drink. <laughs> you see what happens. <laughs> they see how much of a shit show he is. They're like, nah, I don't want that. <laughs> they're like no thank you don't you find that interesting they're, they're not obsessed with fame the way he is and they all don't drink <laughs> uh, and we're all sitting and we got home and that's your karma Isla said you're, you're drinking a lot mm. and I was like really and, and my sister's like you look like I want to put a needle in you and just watch you deflate you look bad Georgia said you're red all the time. Like your face is just red. Now my face is normally red because I'm horrible. I was out in the sun in Florida as a kid, but and that's when I I was at sun. <laughs> First he he blamed his redness on some skin condition. Then he's now blaming it on the Florida sun. <laughs> Come on, Bert. Man. <laughs> I'm not high. I'm just tired. <laughs> my eyes are not red because I just I, I'm just tired. <laughs> what kind of took like i assessed where i was and i was like i was never meant to be 275 mm -hmm. i was never meant dr drinking now is to getting me getting me through the day and it's and, it, and i say that now it's always been like that i wasn't like an early morning I need drinks kind of guy, mm -hmm. but it was just always there and we'd go to play golf and you'd be like ah f it mm -hmm. let's have let's have a Let's just do it. Double Tito's and soda just to start. And everyone's fun. And uh, and when my daughters and my wife said it, I was like, all right. And then I was just like, I'll do a cleanse, drop 15 pounds, start all over. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I was I went to my cardiologist and I was I was trained for it. I like didn't yeah. drink, took a Xanax going in, get my blood pressure down. <laughs> my cardiologist is like, yo, what's going on? <laughs> He's like, you're the fattest you've ever been. And your blood pressure is 120 <laughs> of, over. I don't right. believe this. Right. And uh, and that's when I think I started, I started this journey of like going. If the obsession with the way is getting his blood work done and seeing doctors is odd as well, isn't it? What's that all about? Is that like a weird like? 
Is that like an addiction thing? What is that all about? He seems to go to doctors and to get work all like, again, I don't know if this is common. Do people just get blood work done all the time? Like how often does he get blood work done? Blood work done, blood, like, is it because he wants to just, just what, give himself an excuse to drink or something? It's an odd behavior. It's almost kind of like, um, you know, people that are obsessed with like Googling their symptoms or going on WebMD a little bit. It's like, why are you always getting like, huh? You got Austin Casey. How do Bert's friends even tolerate him and his narcissism? Lol. I can't even stand listening to him on a podcast. You know how. You know how. They're all the same. They're all the same. Don't you recognise or realise sometimes on these guys when they get on pods, they're not really having conversations. They're just waiting for the next person to finish so they can talk about themselves. So I think when you're a narcissist the way these guys are, you actually enjoy talking to other narcissists because you kind of have an opportunity to keep one-upping each other and going in a circle where you can kind of just keep talk, telling, you know, stories about how amazing you guys are, you know? That's all it is. That's why people call it circle jerks, basically. They're just there. Oh my God, I did this. Oh yeah, I remember this awesome thing that I did. Oh yeah, I remember this other awesome thing. Like, it's just like a, a you know, a circle of people just sloshing each other off. But yeah, he's like, that's one thing that I realised where I had to kind of like limit the sort of comedy podcast that I enjoy and just enjoy the clips. Because there was a time when I used to listen to Bert's pod and I legitimately, that's the one emotion I felt listening to it. It was tiring. Like it made me exhausted listening to Bert's pod. Like hearing him have these like fucking go in these spirals when it came to the health thing or suddenly the box wine on the treadmill um the ext like it almost seems like he has an eating disorder in a way does that make sense he'd go from like complete gorging to suddenly be like oh yeah i'm i'm doing complete keto i'm doing complete carnivores out what and then oh i'm not drinking anymore Oh yeah, but it does include the drink that I had at lunch with my agent because, you know, I'm having steak. So of course I've got to have a red wine. It's like, oh. Do, then I need to be in control of my lifestyle. Just quietly, I think the best way to differentiate Bud Light from other beers is they usually say Bud Light in big writing on the can. <laughs> Just saying, hot tip for you. Now, like I said, we've heard most of that before. His wife, kids and sister became concerned for him, but that was the first time I'd heard him say Tom and Rogan were calling him out as well. I didn't know that. And I think that's interesting because I'm sure most of you thought this as well, that Bert's friends are all enablers. Rogan's called him out a couple of times on JRE, but never anything like what he just said there, especially the part where he apparently snapped back at them and told them to mind their own business. I'll tell you what, when you combine that new revelation with him crying over people missing him when he passes on, yeah, that's full-blown narcissism. Why is Ed trying to sell Bert as some sort of role model to his audience? But I will say this, there was one point in this interview where Ed low-key called out Bert's BS, and I thought this was actually really intelligent if I'm being honest, so I want to give Ed some credit here. I get that he's running a popular podcast and it's all about empowerment and positivity and all of that. He's obviously going to find it hard to get good guests on if he's just roasting them all the time, right? Probably why I can never get anybody to come onto this channel. Anyway, but you can even see on Ed's face and through his mannerisms the point at which he's like, okay, hang on, hold up, let's explore this for a moment. And it all started when Bert mentioned people on Reddit speculating about how long he'll last before kicking the bucket. I was in in Austin and I ran into a guy who was like, you're not as fat as the internet says. And I was like, huh? He's like, oh, there's a Reddit thread about like an over under on when you die. And, and by the way, that death thing is very real. Mm -hmm. it, <laughs> <laughs> people die every day b people die every day you're not that important really and truly people die every single day probably at this moment as we're speaking somebody's fucking dropping dead it's not that big of a deal fucking relax man honestly <laughs> you know it's not going to show up there's not going to be like huge things that show up before you die Right. Just one day you have a heart attack. Yep. One day you are pushing it too hard. Yep. And and I love how he thinks he's gonna die like pushing it. No, sometimes you just die from just dying. 
<laughs> it's just, it's just, it just, you just go out. <laughs> you know what I mean? He thinks he's going to be on stage, ripping off his t-shirt, sold out crowd, in the middle of a bar somewhere, surrounded by all these biggest fans. Like, he thinks it's going to be a big event. <laughs> <laughs> and give a fear of that oh Say not as that. much not drinking okay not as much not drinking so the decision for you long term is just going to be this can you moder moderate it and can you regulate it and that's what you're going to have to decide wow did you catch that bert's more afraid of not drinking than he is of dying just let that sink in for a moment but here's where Ed drops a truth bomb on Bert that caught him off guard. Now, I don't know a lot about Ed, but from what I understand, he had a father with some drinking issues. So he tried to offer Bert some firsthand wisdom, which I actually thought was spot on. And true to form, Bert brushed it off and tried to change the subject. I your girls know you love them and believe in them. Uh, both my daughters are hyper aware. I love them more than anything in the world, and I believe in them 100%. I'll tell you something to remember. Oh, can you really say you love your daughters more than anything in the world when you're more afraid of not drinking than dying? <laughs> can you really say your wife and your kids are the most important people in your life when you prioritize touring and boozing as opposed to looking after them and being there for them? Can you really say that? For what it's worth the number one thing that my dad did that was negative with his drinking i'm gonna tell you what it was it was not that he would misbehave when we'd go out in restaurants or that he was a jerk or that he you know got aggressive the insidious thing that my dad's drinking did is i worried about him uh well and 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 that's the thing bro it's like i created internal stress and i created and he created in me my dad created in me this dude who sits here today who has hundreds of millions of dollars, popular show, great friends, blah, 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 and I chronically worry and have anxiety. And the reason I have, I think I have chronic worry and anxiety is I'm familiar with it. Yeah. And we move towards what we're most familiar with in our life. And when I was a little boy, because, and I loved my dad, I didn't want my, I would worry he was going to leave, I was worried to get killed, I was worried he was going to die, I worried he was going to get in a car accident, I was worried he was going to get in a fight, you know? And he wired into me to be a worrier, and it's a repair. Damn, that's real. That's some real shit. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, that's some real shit. I never thought about it that way, you know. If you have an if you have an addict as a parent, that's that's maybe some of the things you, you end up maybe despising about them when you grow up and you're older, like hating them for always making you worry, always making you just fear just fearful of the of the knock on the door, you know? Damn. How does Bert receive this? Let's see how Bert receives this, right? Let's see, because this should be something that should make you reflect. Like, you've got young girls too. You're also a dad. Let's see how, you, how he responds. Repetitive thing I've done. And that's the one thing that you should always govern and watch with your, with your girls is that do they worry about their dad? They yeah. love him. They're proud of him. He's an amazing provider. You on the road a billion nights a year and all the things you've had to do in the travel show and all the stuff to get where you are, they're blessed but you don't want to wire into them this repetitive thought of, I worry about my dad. Mm. I stress about my dad. Let's that was says. the number one thing now Let's that I'm an older says. man. I've, I had anger issues because I watched my dad be angry. My dad raised his voice a lot in the house. I've had a little bit of that too. That was how you parented back then. Right, exactly. And we respected it. But the big thing was- L Look at him trying man, to change the subject. And I, where's this? You see him trying to change the subject. You see him trying to change the subject. This is the time where you can kind of like- in. You know, a bit of self-reflection, maybe a little bit of like come to Jesus moment. Look at him try and change the subject. <laughs> oh, but worst dad in the world. This come from in me. Where's this come from? I know where it comes from. I worried about my dad. That's deep, man. I really like that. It's an. <laughs> but it's like yeah. Uh, anyways. Interesting perspective you don't really hear about. And look, I'm not suggesting for one second that Bert doesn't love his family or anything like that. There is no doubt in my mind that he. I am. I'm suggesting. He wants to be a good. F I, I'll say it. I'm suggesting Bert likes beer more than he likes his family. I think he puts up with his family. I think they're a good addendment to his life. I think they provide good content for his comedy. 
I think there may be a good ego boost. You know, there's some guys out there that just like the vision of having like a wife and kids and a, and a dog and a house and shit, right? It's good, like, it's good kind of a crew, it's good like trophies to put on a shelf somewhere. But does he love them? No, because if he did, you wouldn't live the way you do. Simple as that. There's more, I have more understanding and more sympathy and empathy for a dude out there who's working a nine to five, busting his ass, two jobs, trying to look after his kids, look after his wife and stuff that turns to drink more than understandable. But when you're a person that's brought up in privilege, you was able to coast through life. You had a rich dad, you know, you went, you fucking did, you were, you were in college for like, what, six years or some shit like that, right? Like you're able to pursue a career in comedy. You've not had, you've never be, you never missed a bill. You've never gone a day hungry and you've turned into an alcoholic. You are a loser. I'm sorry. A regular, normal working class person a regular person working a normal job, I understand why you turn to booze. Life can be hard. Life can be difficult. And sometimes blacking out a few times can help you get over things. But when you've grown up in the lap of privilege and you turn into like, he, Bert looks like some of the people that I see walking around the street, some of the zombie crackers you see walking around, that skin, that like, like, why? Why? What reason could you have to drink yourself to that level when you're somebody as, you know, fortunate enough as Bert is to live the life that he does what could honestly make you want to do that he does a few and they said already he loves to drink it's pure indulgence he just loves it so I say he definitely loves his booze more than his family 100% sure father and provider and all of that stuff but the bottom line is that drinking and partying is more important to him I mean he said it himself he's more scared of not drinking than he is of dying Live your life to the fullest, I guess. But even in the face of Ed's advice about not letting your kids stress out over your well-being because it will stay with them for life, Bert just tried to change the subject and talk about how parenting used to be different. So then Bert's public therapy session eventually turned to the whole idea of imposter syndrome. Oh man, this was great. Bert puts the imposter in imposter syndrome. Is there a part of you because you're so humble? Do you have, I have, like <clears throat> massive imposter syndrome? Oh, and if you don't have an imposter syndrome, you're an imposter. Like mm -hmm. if you're, it, imposter syndrome's real. It's authentic. When we first bought our, when we bought our big house, like the one we're in now, yeah. I was so terrified to post any video on social media because I didn't want anyone to think I had money. I didn't want to lose mm -hmm. the, the who I was mm -hmm. and like show my backyard. I have a beautiful backyard mm. now, i will say this i worked very hard to earn that backyard sure. i got very lucky to marry a wife who can recognize good properties but i was terrified to show that <laughs> what kind of what kind of what kind of uh what kind of compliment is that i married a wife that can recognize good properties what <laughs> Amazing mother, an amazing uh, amazing wife, a great companion. She's my best friend, soulmate. Nah, no, I married a woman that's really good at Zillow. Okay. <laughs> and I, I hardcore consistently live with this imposter syndrome. Yep, the imposter syndrome was big on this one, but just wait until you hear the next question. Ed asks Bert to pinpoint exactly what it is that made him so successful. What is it? Like, what's don't don't be humble. Like, what's the thing with you? Is it that you like connect with everyday people? Joe Rogan. Like, is it like I know you're fun. Joe Rogan. Funny, right? But like, is it Joe Rogan? Like, hey man, I'm rooting for that dude because I see Joe Rogan. Me in him. <sighs> Joe Rogan. What is the thing about you? Is it the Joe Rogan? The work ethic? Is it what? Is Joe Rogan is it that's made you joe rogan you in that seat will smith right now we beat you because we're friends with joe rogan <laughs> <laughs> so the story of our careers <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have to try out for a team uh, we got picked <laughs> our dad so owns nice. league <laughs> uh, we didn't do anything during this oh sorry guys that was my fault i must have mixed up the clips by accident my bad here's the actual response i'm sure there's a lot of aspects of this but i'll tell you the one thing i know and i promise you i didn't watch this video before i promise you i'm watching this video in real time and i had no idea that was gonna happen i promise you i promise you big up podcast cringe that i don't have that i have that not a lot of my 
peer groups have is I don't mind failing. Ah, uh, that's the one, the sto story of Bert's life, failing upwards. But Ed presses him for what? If anything, if I would give him a compliment, I'd say one of the major things that probably helps him is that he doesn't have a filter. He overshares and he's very shameless in that regard. Or in his, yeah, sorry, he overshares, he doesn't have a filter and he's unabashedly a fame whore. Like he's not ashamed of wanting to be famous. He doesn't see that as cringe. He doesn't see that as embarrassing. He doesn't see that as maybe self-absorbed. He doesn't, you know what I mean? He, 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 he wants to be famous. He's always said, his dream was to always be famous. He's always wanted to be famous. So I think that, that and obviously having no filter are good mechanisms to allow you to be well-known this in the era that we're living in nowadays. Obviously the most important thing is Rogan, but if I was to give him a compliment, I'd say, his lack of shame and his, you know, single-minded pursuit to be famous is probably why he's not successful. For more, he really wants to get inside Bert's head for his listeners to understand the true genius behind Bert's success. Let's see what else he could get out of him. Let me ask you one last question on it. And I mean that, like, take care of yourself. You're, you're way more of an important dude in people's lives than you realize because you have a, you have a lot of confidence. And I know that there's probably this side of you that people are like, hey, man, don't get too big. But there's this other part of you, bro. You have such deep humility. What? I love people that have both of those things. They're super confident, but they got a lot of humility. If someone was listening to this, they're like, hey, man, you chased your dream. Like, you had no idea. You're just a dude in college. And by the way, everybody, I want to re reinforce this. If you have not seen The Machine on Netflix, you have to go see this movie. It's it's a ride. And That's one thing that he hasn't spoken about, honestly. I'm surprised. That I'm not, so, not going to lie. I, I thought there'd be a lot more like humility and understanding of how hard it is to make movies now because he came into it super confident, super cocky and obviously fell flat on his face. Um, I would assume there'd be a lot more, um, what's that thing called? Self-deprecation. But he's really ignored this movie. Since it failed, he doesn't talk about it anymore. Like this movie is like fucking, this movie is like his Tiger Fig Whiskey. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it doesn't get mentioned. And it's one of those movies like you don't really want it to end. It's the every minute of it is entertaining. Oh, every you. single minute of this movie is entertaining. It's funny, but it's like it's a real story. I'm sure it's you know jived up a little bit. It's so good. Oh, a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and all of his Netflix specials, Razzle Dazzle out, is out right now. But like all of them are awesome. Go check his stuff out. But let me ask you this last. Name a joke. Name a joke. How does it end? How does it start? What's the themes? Name something. I bet you couldn't name a single fucking joke from the specials. Razzle Dazzle's amazing. Yo, this guy, man. <laughs> if someone was listening to this, they're like, hey, man, I would like to pursue my dream too, but I have a lot of anxiety. I got a lot of worry. I got a lot of imposter. Find a Rogan. I got all this stuff. You Find a Rogan. Describe that you still have it. Find a Rogan. And you made it. Any Find a Rogan. Anyway. Find a Rogan. What advice would you give to somebody? Befriend a Rogan. Somebody who's like sitting. Befriend a Rogan. They're going, whatever it is, they want to open. Befriend a Rogan. A, a bakery. What Befriend a Rogan. Whatever it is, right? They Befriend a Rogan. Want to start painting. Grow up rich. What would you say to them? Grow up rich. We beat you because we're friends with Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> so the story of our careers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, again? I must have some lines crossed or something. Hang on a second. I'll see if I can find the right clip. First of all, the procrastination is the best part. Mm -hmm. Like, just don't don't worry about the time you've spent procrastinating. That's all the build-up stuff. Those are the muscles you're getting to get you to where you need to be. be what? Huh? Don't worry about wasting time. Isn't that the most I grew up rich thing you've ever heard in your life? Isn't that the most I've grown up rich thing you've heard in your entire life don't worry about wasting time <laughs> the one non-renewable resource we all have <laughs> don't worry about wasting it <laughs> oh mate that's the most nepo baby thing i've ever heard do follow your passion just follow your heart <laughs>
Listen to your heart. <laughs> it will guide you. <laughs> Ayahuasca. Mushrooms. Uh, honestly, I did mushrooms. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't worry about wasting time. It's all going to be okay. Uh, No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> what some guy asking for advice right he's like a 42 year old open micer um he's got three kids <laughs> he's like hey how can i make it but it's like hey man don't worry about the time you wasted just follow your heart but my wife is complaining that i'm not bringing any money in the house follow your heart but my kids don't have fresh school uniforms follow your heart <laughs> We have to share one car <laughs> and my wife has to drive to work every morning. Full of, full of your heart, full of your heart, full of your passion. When really you should be telling that 42-year-old open comp, open micer to basically get a job and give up on his dreams or at the very least get a job and then follow his dreams on the side. You shouldn't be telling him, hey, it's all going to be okay. <laughs> Put it on the vision board. <laughs> what you need to do you need to picture where you want to be and you just put it on a piece of paper. <laughs> and one day it will happen. You just wake up and you'll be at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> oh my God, bro. Because I procrastinated just like you did. I'd had great ideas and didn't know where to pitch them and didn't know what to do with them. And then, and then... That's not really procrastination though, is it? One day, you're... One day you're going to stop giving a f what everyone else says. It, but you got to let that happen for you. You got to let yourself say, I'm not going to tell my friends this idea. Uh, they're just going to shit on it. And you just, you just got to say, f it. you really got to say, f it and go, I'm going to try it. I, I don't want, I don't care if they make fun of me. That's part of the process. Also, let them make fun. Of me. The worst advice in the world, man. The worst. Of, maybe there's a bit of good advice, but there's just go for it. Fuck it. But unfortunately, and this is one of the things that most Nepo babies don't seem to be able to kind of comprehend. Most of us don't have the time to just do things. That's the thing people don't really realize. It's why the some of the Joe Rogan rhetoric around everyone should start their own business and to, to make their own handmade knives and furniture is a little bit insulting because some people just don't have the time. They just can't do it. They have responsibilities. They have people they have to look after. They have a job they, they've got they want to keep. They have a career maybe they're trying to pursue. They just don't have the ability to just drop things and try a dream or go for like It's not something that's within their... It's just not something they can actually do. But when you grow up in privilege, that's what, that's what privilege affords you. It affords you time to just explore things and to try things out, which is a good thing. But for some reason, they don't seem to be able to understand that. They think it's all, oh no, it's my hard work that got me here. It's my hustle. It's like, but what else in Casey? Stop caring what people think is the strangest advice from a guy that cares the most about others' opinions. Amen. The most caring of, the most caringest of guys is also the guy that says to you not to care what people think. It's almost like the Brendan thing. I don't read comments and he's always in the comments. <laughs> I post and ghost, but you're always fucking reading shit. Like, come on, bro. Be honest in Casey. Fun of me. Half the making fun of me is gonna get put me in the right direction anyway. But you gotta say fuck it. You gotta go after it. You you I think sometimes had I never got on stage or had I never answered that phone when Rolling Stone magazine called, had I never taken the balls to it's the same thing about getting in the god polar plunge. That energy is real you do not no fucking way is he trying to compare or use going in a cold plunge as an ex <sighs> i'm sorry but that is the definition of being privileged if you think the hardest thing to do in your life is to have a cold shower that is a definition of growing up in the lap of privilege that you think the hardest thing for a human being to do is to sit down in a cold bathtub for a couple of minutes like are you fucking crazy that's the hardest that's the hardest thing right that's the hardest thing the most challenging thing in your life has been sitting in a tub full of ice cubes 
Oh, God almighty. After my cold plunge, that's when I realized <laughs> impossible is nothing. <laughs> oh. Want to do it. You're standing on the edge of the pool. All those moments on the edge of the pool are just as valuable as the moments in the pool. Respect the edge of the pool as much as you do inside the pool. And let yourself sit with it. Be scared. Do not want to do it. Lay in your bed. Roll around. I don't want to f***ing go in. This is it. I'm putting all my eggs in this basket. Joe Rogan's influence on these guys is... And again, I, I'm a big fan of Rogan. Like I've been listening to Rogan's podcast for like since what, the early 400s. And I honestly can say the only thing that he's ever really... I'm like, okay, I'm inspired by this. I want to do is maybe like the martial arts things. Like maybe I, maybe I kind of, yeah, I probably did get into UFC because of Rogan. But I can't understand how these grown men who know him use him as such a fucking guiding light for all their things they do in life. They really, really put him this guy on a pedestal, which probably I think we should give Rogan some level of credit because. He has his faults. He's probably getting worse with age in terms of some of his, his Delulu opinions and shit and how he's starting to lean right and believe in all these conspiracy theories and just become a little bit unhinged. But let's give the guy some credit. He is quite well adjusted when compared to how much people suck him off. Because I feel like if this was anybody else, they would be crazy. The fact that Rogan has these type of people around him and he's not as deranged as he probably could be says a lot about him. The fact that he's kept himself somewhat grounded because this is odd. And then once you jump in, go all the way deep, get, get your head under. Don't just mm -hmm. put your toe in it. Mm -hmm. Go all the way deep and charge it. You get one shot at this life. And if you leave anything on the table... It's just left on the table. It's it's you don't you don't get to take it with you. Sorry, just a second, guys. I'm making some notes here. Don't be afraid to procrastinate heaps, and then when you're ready to dive into the pool, go all the way deep. Make sure you put all your eggs in one basket. Okay, all right. Okay, got it. <laughs> now, come on, guys. Really, we all know the story. Bert owes almost everything to. Tom Segura and, of course, Joe Rogan. He's even admitted that being friends with Rogan carried his career. I just can't seem to find the clip right now where he said that. But remember the phone call that started all of this? Rogan called Bird and he was on a motorbike in Vietnam filming his travel show. And Rogan told him he had to stop that and do stand-up comedy full-time. Then he got him on his podcast and made him tell the machine story. And then he told him he should tell the story at every opportunity he gets. Yeah, thanks, Joe. How's that going? You're a real stand-up guy. Anyway, guys, no investigative journalisms today. Just some old-fashioned podcast cringe. Yeah. What do you think that is about? What do you think that is about? When it's so obvious, again, because... Maybe because I'm a fan of Rogan, but I don't think it's a bad thing that Rogan makes your career. Because I think that's what being a good friend is. Because I feel like, I said it many times on here, I think if any other comedian in Rogan's circle was Rogan, I don't think they'd be as charitable as he is or as open as he is with his platform and shit. I don't think so. So the fact that Rogan does do what he does for his friends is commendable. It's something that people should like give him a lot more credit for. Um, that he's able to kind of use his platform to signal boost his friends, change their lives and basically give them, you know, basically he gives them more than money because, you know, I'm sure he has a lot of friends around him that ask him for loans, but I think it's actually beneficial for you to actually just go on his show and get a little boost from there and then build yourself up that way as opposed to asking him to lend you a fucking a grand or a hundred grand or something it probably does people way more good because it makes you self-sufficient right um it's that that old adage about you know teach a man how to fish and all that shit so he does really well with it but i don't really understand why the guys that benefit from it are so reticent to like 
admit it. There's, there's, they, 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 they go out of their way not to admit it. Like, why wouldn't you? It's not like we're saying he's the sole reason why you're successful, but he did play some of a part in it, like a big part. It's not the full reason, but he did play a part. So to not acknowledge it is almost like you're disrespecting him a little bit. It's almost like you're taking for granted the fact that he did that for you, you know, by not admitting it. Because no one here is sitting here saying that Bert is only successful because of Joe Rogan. I know I said the joke, but he's obviously a hard worker. He's obviously not afraid of doing social media, all these type of things that hold people back and stuff. He does have a level of no fear, all this sort of stuff. There is an element of having some level of talent. He's able to connect with people. He Maybe it's the every man boozing thing people seem to like, whatever it may be. But not admitting that Rogan played a part in your success is so odd when it's so obvious to see. There's, it's just, I don't know why all of them have a tendency to do that. They don't want to admit it when it's clear as day why, you know, like, I don't know. It's it's a strange thing that I've observed with these kind of guys. I don't really understand it, but hey, big up podcast cringe. Big up podcast cringe. What are you guys saying in the stream chat? Um, it's lame because there are better comics out there who deserve it and keep giving out handouts to these bums. Yeah. Yeah. I... <sighs> The deserve was an interesting one. I don't know if you actually, I don't know if you even deserve anything in this world. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Maybe I'm a little bit too extreme that way. I'm not too sure if anyone deserves anything. You're not really entitled to anything, really. A career, a job, a family. I don't think you're entitled to anything. You kind of have to just get in. You just, you kind of have to go out there and get it, really, for the, for the most part. But, but, if anything, the way, the way their careers are handed to them on the plate, I can fully understand why people don't like them, you know? Because if you compare their careers to like, like, you, like um, what you call it? Like um, Go said there, if you compare it to a regular open mic and what they have to do to be successful, you know? And it doesn't work out, even if they are talented, it's like, it's a little bit unfair, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Especially when you see their specials, you're like, God, these guys are terrible, you know? But then, I don't know. I'm getting to a point now, after seeing Kill Tony, watching Kill Tony a few times, I'm getting to a point where I'm thinking, a lot of stand up, most stand up comedians aren't good, you know? Unfortunately. I just think it's one of those art forms that. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, let's go back to this. What are you guys saying? The commentary is continuing here. Um, it's lame. Uh, it's just like everything else. It's about striking the balance between two extremes. Exactly, NJ Ranger. Very libertarian of you, AZ. Bodybuilder News. Stinger Goose says we deserve better than these 1,000. NJ Ranger. Getting where you fit in. Marcus Aurelius. Hilarious. George Carlin. Special. I mean, Go says, I mean, there are more talented comics. You are right. Technically, no one deserves it, but there are better comics who... Okay, cool. You're right, go. Let, let me let me rephrase what I said. Maybe because I've been on the internet for too long and I've been on, like, most of you guys on the stream probably are the same. I've been on the internet since the internet was the internet. I've been on chat rooms. I've been on forums. Like, nothing really affects me. I mean, I don't, don't really care. Like, I've seen everything. I've seen it all. I don't really understand, like, people that get affected by bad comments or start crying about people hating. It's just odd because the internet is the internet. It's fucking lawless. It is fucking Sodom and Gomorrah. You just enjoy the shit show and you just keep it moving. But I've always found it very interesting and very odd how stand-up comedians on podcast would be like, oh, um, I don't understand why people hate. Uh, or they'll say this comment about comedians like, oh, I don't, like, it's so good comedy right now because we all get to, like, put, you know, we all come on each other's podcasts and we get to bring each other up, all this sort of nonsense. And I never understood that because I feel like these comedians, especially the ones within the JRE verse, if if there's anyone you could hate if you're an up and coming comedian, it would be them, because most of their careers have been propped up by the friendship they have with Rogan, most of them. So I never understood why these guys think like no one can hate them, how no one can maybe envy them, especially if they're in the same scene, when their careers aren't necessarily proportionate to their level of talent. You know, like if anything, those guys are easier to hate 
because of their friendship with Rogan as opposed to the other people who are trying to get out the mud you know I never understood that kind of way of thinking like how can you hate me there's there's all oh, or oh, they'll say like um just because I've got an opportunity doesn't mean I takes it away from you it's like mm, it kind of does though isn't it because there there isn't an infinite amount of fans out there there's only certain amount of money is divvied out to certain level of comedians so maybe if all the top comedians are terrible but they're famous and they're getting all the money that's obviously going to have a trickle down effect on the guys who are coming up <laughs> because all the guys holding the wealth are the ones at the top who are shit look at the list of nominees of the golden globes for the best specials not the greatest <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like i don't know um and naturally comedians anyway as we've seen with them with podcasts they pick up Sarlux. nice cap roof yeah you know what we're doing you know what we're doing you know how we do it. Big up Silux, appreciate it, bro. Um and also comedians, as we've seen with podcasts, they're very bitchy. They're very backstabby. They're very snaky. So I don't know, man. I think, you know, I don't know. There's an element of me that I think the lady protests too much. I honestly think behind the scenes they all talk about each other. They all are very jealous. They all think they deserve what the other person has. So when they say the things that they say about, oh, I don't know how people can hate, it's just like, really though? Anyway, let's watch a Tune Town. So, um, Tune Town. Oh yeah, big up, big up. Um, what's that? Big up, Sir Easy Tiger. Been watching your vids for a while. First time tuning in. Great takes and you're hilarious, bro. Positive vibes, y'all. Big up, Sir Easy Tiger. Appreciate you tuning in appreciate the kind words and welcome to the greatest show on earth where we sit here as lowly regular civilians who haven't accomplished much pointing and laughing at people who've accomplished far more than we have <laughs> and have way more in the bank than us because guess what it's fun <laughs> and we have nothing else better to do with our time so that's what we do we just point and laugh <laughs> even though most of these people could hire contract killers to kill us in our sleep some of them could kill us with their bare hands brendan <laughs> it doesn't matter it, it brings us a lot of joy to just point and laugh at them like i've said plenty of times here i don't watch reality tv it's not my thing but the one thing i do do is this this is my reality tv the BAPA verse, the GRE verse, this is my my 600 pound life. This is my love island. This is my dating in the dark. This is it. <laughs> and I'll be damned if someone tries to stop me. I'll be damned.